Hello everyone, welcome again to another Teacher Joseph podcast. This weekend is Notting Hill Carnival, and that's uh, one of the biggest street parades in Central Europe. And after our protests of a few weeks ago, you remember those when British people were getting very upset, uh, these kinds of carnivals are very, very important. It says here, organisers of Notting Hill Carnival have said the festivities this year will take on a renewed importance and remind people of the need for diversity and inclusion after the far-right riots that took place this month. More than a million people are expected to line the streets of West London this weekend for the 56th annual carnival, one of the biggest street festivals in the world. The uh, carnival, Notting Hill Carnival, is one of these events which is to celebrate black culture. It's been going for many years. Uh, this is number 56. And it says here, the three-day event will take place on a three-mile parade showcasing spectacular displays and vibrant masqueraders to the soundtrack of Soca Beats, Calypso and Steel Bands. And they, they go on to say that uh, this is very, very important to bring about some kind of sense of diversity and inclusion. And this is from The Guardian, the 24th of August, which is today. It says here, uh, we get our messages across um, with our presence. Uh, it's very important that we go to the streets. And there are some lovely photographs here of last year's festival, I think it is. Um, and they're saying this year they're promoting a message of unity and anti-racism. We feel in 2024 we shouldn't have to worry about stepping out our doors uh, and worry about being attacked. I wasn't aware that black people were part of this um, anti-immigration protest movement. I thought it was largely aimed at Islamic people. But uh, anyway, this uh, parade, which takes place this weekend in central London, uh, is going to be very beautiful with lots of colour. It's kind of like um, the carnival in Rio, if you've ever read or seen that, uh, but on a much smaller scale. But that's the same kind of idea. And uh, if you're concerned about modesty, uh, perhaps it's not the carnival for you because there's lots of people here uh, in these pictures, wearing very skimpy clothes, um, coming from the Caribbean, but a very beautiful, uh, a very beautiful festival. Now, speaking about the protests, I'm very pleased to say that they've all finished now, but I think the mindset is still there, so no doubt this is something which is going to come back in the future. I'd like to comment about that just for a minute about these protests. I have a theory. Now, this is one of these teacher Joseph opinions, okay? So <laughs> uh, feel free to switch off or just say, no, <laughs> no, teacher Joseph, sorry. <laughs> You're going down a wrong road there. But let me tell you what I think. These protests, which happened a few uh, weeks ago across the UK, which I'm sure you've read about, um, where some mosques were attacked, uh, immigrants, particularly those um, from Southeast Asia, Africa and other places were sadly uh, attacked or put into compromising positions or felt threatened by protesters. Now, as far as I know, most of those people were from Southeast Asia, but it seems clear that um, a lot of Africans uh, were also in our um, containment where we hold uh, refugees 
and immigrants who don't have documentation. Many of the protests took place outside of those buildings and, of course, at mosques as well. So this is what I think. I don't actually think that these protesters were protesting about immigration. <clears throat> I think there's something much bigger at work. And that thing, I believe, is a mixture of very basic skin color and also some kind of expression uh, of masculinity. Let me explain a little bit more about that. Uh, black, brown, of course, these are rather dominant colors. And I think British people, especially what we, we can say for the purposes of this podcast, white people feel incredibly threatened. Now, British people generally have never been very good at handling the topic of masculinity. We come from traditions where the church has set a standard of hyper-masculinity. The man is supposed to be the provider. The man is supposed to be strong. The man is supposed to be someone who is kind of invincible and uh, in many ways uh, people should be unable to defeat him. He's the man, you know. However, over the last number of years, the role of the man has been redefined. <clears throat> Christianity has slowly vanished, uh, and that's something which is continuing very quickly. Uh, how men behave in public as well as private is also changing. Um, what are the, the things that we use to define masculinity, like strength, drinking more than other people, um, wearing a leather jacket and dark glasses to look like we are archetypes of very strong men. That's all gone and is considered to be toxic. However, there are still people around, of course, who are not comfortable with that because they feel like their power has been taken away. Uh, so as a result, um, they're left very confused. We have some men who are in the process of becoming women. That's trans people course uh, and that also covers women who are going through some kind of dysphoria and becoming men men becoming women and we also have a lot of confusion about what were previously unwritten gender roles and codes so it should be of no surprise to anyone that some people are still not able to deal with this and I think a lot of that is behind our current protests. Um, of course, uh, what we're seeing, how that's coming out, is an attack on immigrants. But you'll notice, though, that the attack on immigrants did not extend to white immigrants. The people who were clearly being attacked or being protested about were all immigrants of color. Uh, so I think that tells us that there's an anger there at masculinity. There's an anger there at people who feel, uh, well, there's an anger there by people who feel they are emasculated. So a lot of young men now, they'll have women bosses, for example. Um, their role as men is seriously undermined. And then we have this uh, this movement coming up called the incel culture. That's another group of very angry young men who say that they're forced to be celibates because uh, women no longer are prepared just to give men what they want when they feel like it. So there's a lot of anger as we transition from this patriarchal society into something more matriarchal. And I think when I started to uh, work here in the UK, when I first 
uh, left education and everyone was male. In the workplace, women were there, but they weren't considered really suitable for promotions because, of course, they would be having families and leaving. And men were considered to be the providers, the people who were serious about making careers. That way of thinking, though, is all gone. And I think a lot of younger people just haven't been able to deal with that, especially those who come from more traditional communities. As I look around and see friends, neighbours and communities transforming, it's very clear now on the streets that there's same-sex couples, people transitioning between genders, and now to be masculine or feminine is nothing to do with how you look, it's to do with your actions. And I'm not sure we can even still consider those to be particularly masculine or feminine. Those words appear to be kind of out of date. So when I see these protesters attacking uh, vulnerable people, I think it's because the protesters themselves are feeling emasculated and they're trying somehow to bring about a sense of masculinity to put other men down. And what's really interesting about that, and again, this is just my opinion, okay, what's really interesting is who they've chosen to attack, because they've chosen to attack people who are um, of colour, and that may also tell us something, because as I mentioned a moment ago, Black and brown are both dominant colours, so they're attacking the very things which they deem to be masculine. So there's kind of reverse psychology there, I think. I don't know. I'm not a psychologist, but that's what I think. I think this has little to do with immigration, and I think this has a lot to do with masculinity, we're still raising people to believe that men are all powerful because after all, if you look at the top brass of society, there's not too many women there. And you could argue and say, yes, Teacher Joseph, but you had a queen for many, many years. Yes, and she did bring a very calming influence to what was a very patriarchal society during the time of the British Empire. But she was very humble. So was Queen Victoria. Queen Victoria said, this is just a quote, she said um, that Britain should not be ruled by women, it should be ruled by men, and that she was only in her position uh, because of tradition. She wasn't in favour at all of women's rights, for example. So it's very interesting, isn't it? Um, and I think that, in part, has been responsible for our problems over the last few uh, months with these protests. And I think it's going to continue as we, as a community, as a country, transition into this new era where your gender or your sexuality is fluid I think there's going to be a lot of people who just aren't going to be okay having their power removed from them uh, as they previously had viewed themselves as being engendered with a particular role to play. So yeah, you can't just change a society within a few years and say, okay, that's it, no more masculine, feminine, now you can do what you want. A lot of men here are feeling very enraged uh, and they feel that they're having their masculinity taken away from them. And I think this is the result. Probably in America as well, uh, they've not even had a female president yet. So they're still in a place of great transition as these new ideas, and this new feminine arises um, which is rattling some cages along the way. Well, that's it from me. Just my little opinion. See you all soon. Bye.